morning all. Here we are on a Sunday morning and it's time for another database 1.7. So there's actually quite a lot to talk about here on my board. So I'm going to get stuck into the very first one and that is that Stadia loses steam. But is there trouble ahead? I do think there is and I've got some notes on this one because I wanted to talk about this one properly and it's something that's close to my heart in terms of my original startings off in this industry and working with the big companies. So it was not really a big surprise to me to see the news that Google has pulled the plug on its cloud-based streaming service. I'm sure many of you. Um, they've done it before, they've got previous, and the promises they made at the start were never achieved. And most of that was they never really put the effort, see resources into doing it properly. They could have done, they should have done, they didn't. I'm not saying I supported it, I've covered the whole streaming area and issues with my coverage already on the PlayStation Plus browsing system, PS Now, you know, PS Plus Now, but I, I could make an entire video on the missed opportunities fundamentally that they could have done here. They could have integrated it into YouTube, for example, offered full browser support, they tried to create the living room, the, the PC console experience from day one, which was always going to be an uphill battle anyway, and they didn't really do it right and didn't do it justice. Anyway, the main reason for this discussion is I believe they've done this not because they couldn't continue. It's not a secret, really, that Google is a very wealthy company, and if they wanted to, they could have continued to stay there indefinitely via a subsidy, further investment, and other areas, even moving into publisher acquisitions, should any be left, that is. So this is not a conversation on finance, but one of strategy. It's well known that Stadia was off to a bad start from the get-go with this, and with the target audience always being a challenge, even the most ignorant business planner would have assigned more than just three years to make this a success. From its 2019 launch during the pandemic, they likely expected a captive audience at that time, and it didn't materialise. So no, I think the decision made here is the war will continue, but they've picked a new battleground. And that is against an old adversary. Microsoft and its current consolidation approach. Again, something I have said multiple times, this is always Microsoft's MO. With Game Pass being another lost leader for the business, it is always a means to an end. But the buying up of the biggest publishing houses over the past two years has not gone unnoticed by all, and Google is certainly one of them. There is no love lost between these two behemoths and they have previous on hitting out at each other, most recently in the Epic versus Apple lawsuit where Microsoft, again, making business allies at the time with Epic as it was the best choice for them. They supported Epic and went up against Google and its Play Store control. The irony here, I'm sure, is not lost on any of you. But even prior to this, many moons ago, Google pulled full support for Silverlight within its ubiquitous browser, and of which they succeeded in killing off the dominant Microsoft Internet Explorer. Poetic justice, some would say, for what Microsoft did to Netscape, and more so Mosaic. This cost Microsoft a lucrative development route to market, one which actually affected me directly at the time with a project I've been managing and working on for three years. The long and short of this is I think Google again see blood in the water, as they did with Internet Explorer. The level that Microsoft is taking over the gaming landscape is clear. The ZeniMax purchase was already a huge one, and this is a significant portion of the market that was previously multi-platform that will affect all others. And Microsoft have already said that they're going exclusive on these titles, so it's naive to think they're not going to do the same thing with every other purchase. That's why you buy them. And this is not just Sony who are affected, as many other companies also make games for mobile, which is a huge market, simply ginormous revenue stream for Google within its Play Store. And now you see why Microsoft got involved with Epic. So it's only fair that Google returns the favour, and I think this is what we will see. In fact, Phil Harrison has already stated that the Bethesda purchase affected them, and the current Activision one would also make a big impact on their market, one which I'm sure will make them the single biggest publishing house in the market. Thus, the next stage of this business plan is for Google to join Sony, and they will file an antitrust request alongside Sony, and the UK Commissioner has already put Microsoft on notice as they see issues with this and have requested more information, which, as of the time of making this video at least, Microsoft have refused to provide. They really want information on Game Pass profits and budgets, something which Microsoft will not give them. So this does give clear reason for suspicion on a monopoly as the logic behind this, and again, they've got previous. Spending 70 billion on a purchase to fund a business model that is currently losing money hand over fist means that the end game is the focus here, not the market. 
that of consolidation and market control. And this will affect Google just as much as Sony and Apple and everyone else. In fact, we can already see the revenue shift from Microsoft to claw some of this back with their new publisher in Bethesda charging the same $70 price for the Switch port of Skyrim that they called Sony out for only a few months back. Those in glass houses and all that. Now, I will stress this is not new at all, and all's fair in love and war and business. Not for Microsoft, anyway, as they often buy competition to absorb them or even close them down. See Fox Pro, which they used to build Exchange in the 90s, or Live Meeting, which eventually became Teams via other attempts. Fast, which is a core aspect of SharePoint, is another one, and a big part of Microsoft earnings as a whole, not to mention Nokia and them giving up on Windows phones when they actually started selling. Beam, AT&T Cloud to drive xCloud. Suffice to say, they follow the same path over and over again. And I could go on for ages on this. I've got a lot of experience. I was literally in the market at the time. So I did see and get affected by a lot of what was going on with markets. Very fast, incredible growth at, at certain points throughout the 90s and early 2000s. Anyway, I'm probably going on a bit too much. To close this out, that I think the Activision acquisition is almost certain to be delayed, in my opinion. I believe we will see Google join the fight here, which may just mean others also decide to push back on this. And I think one thing is certain, simply finding Microsoft a few million dollars per day never works. Just look at what they did to Netscape back in the 90s. And I could say the Mosaic situation where they just screwed them over by saying you can have some profits on the plus model, and then they just bundle it free in their operating system, meaning that they made no money out of it. And in the end, they only got, I was at $8 million to actually get that Mosaic. And Mosaic is what Internet Explorer was built on, if, if many of you don't know. Microsoft tend to not make many products. They tend to buy them and then adapt them. So, all of this could really go the way of the Intuit takeover that also fell through in the 90s. Um, that was because of the long, drawn-out legal issues, and in the, end, in the end, that monopoly was very clear what they were trying to do with that, which fundamentally is what Microsoft Office and Excel were all targeted for. So I do believe this is going to be a long, drawn-out battle, and I do believe that Activision sale will not go through anytime soon. And obviously, that's going to cost a couple of billion to Microsoft, but do you know what? They're good for it. So next on the list is the NVIDIA RTX launch. Yes, it was shown two weeks back or whatever it was. I can't remember now. Um, yeah, the 4090 specs, they look almost as big as a price, don't they? But those 4080s, mm, they look a little strange to me. We've got another TNT2 M64 GeForce MX2 on our hands here from NVIDIA. I mean, that 4080 12 gig looks more like a 4060. Um, it's definitely a smaller die. It's not the same chip. Uh, huge reduction in bandwidth so yeah something very odd going on well it's not odd let's be honest um, but yeah something very Nvidia going on there I mean the constant cycle for new PC generations has, has never been a fixed schedule okay so there is generations in PC I don't care what anyone says there is you know I've been around since the beginning and you do get to a point where you can't play stuff anymore and we've had big defining moments and fast cycles in the past notably in the mid to late 90s when you could purchase a 3D accelerator in 96 and it was practically obsolete by 97 I, I covered this in my Dreamcast um, Neon 250 video so go and check them out for more information at the time back then but the ATI Rage card, the Savage S3, and even NVIDIA's own debut in the NV2, they all took the, the, the path of, of dying out very quickly, largely because they took the Sega Saturn path of quad rendering on the NV2, but we all know how that ended up. I mean, the, the, the end of the day, the next shift was really hardware and transformer lines in the early 2000s, and that really hit you by 2003, where you couldn't really play games because it was becoming too standard for engines to need it. Uh, but obviously there was a point when the fast CPU still built it as well, so it wasn't as clear cut as that. Like everything with technology, it doesn't just because they tell you it's the best thing in the world and you need it, doesn't mean you do. You need to, you know, educate yourself on it and understand what's out there. So since then we've we've had faster updates and refined improvements to the programmable shader architecture that kicked off with the Xbox 360. And we we could also be reaching a point with the latest set of cards from NVIDIA and later AMD that may not quite restrict you playing in the modern games, but it could very well be a heavily pared back affair due to both raster and ray tracing increases of two or four times over the 3000 series they're claiming. And that's the biggest of the lot in the 3090 Ti, which let's be honest, you know, less than 1% probably own. But wait a minute. This is, this is the old NVIDIA at play here again, isn't it? I mean, smoke and mirrors that Paul Daniels would be impressed with. I mean, look look at the chart that they've shown. The game that's hitting four times here is Cyberpunk 2077, and it's with a new and possibly exclusive new ray tracing mode in Overdrive. So nothing new here. We can take it on face value. We cannot compare this to how the game runs on current hardware at the same settings, let alone the 3090 Ti. 
And as such, I think the 4X can be safely ignored here, or at best an edge case based on their new technologies which they're pushing, that of DLS 3.0. The next best on the chart again in, in ray tracing is that NVIDIA RTX Racer. Again, it's a hand-tailored demo, gameplay, whatever. So it shows off how the game can be designed around a card, or at least a small vertical slice of a game that can obviously be much better than a multi-platform title made to run on a myriad of cards and APIs, just like console titles. So this is not really viable in the open-ended platform of the PC market is, but it does leave us with a brand new RTX portal update that effectively adds ray traced effects to the core game using an injection process that transforms the materials and then intercepts the calls. In this case, from a game and engine designed around a fixed function hardware design, not a programmable shader method. And we've seen this since around 2008 in the PC market. I mean, this is an old title. And again, I think this only supports DX9. Uh, it might support DX10, I'll have to check, uh, but it's, it's not modern games you can do this with. And again, it's all around that fixed function. So they can you know, safely predict what's going to come and use their JIT, their just-in-time process, translate it on the fly. That interpreter runs within the engine and then they can interpret the calls and then change them with the new material. So the results here show we're getting a three and a half times at best, which is a 9 and 20 year old game, albeit with this new and impressive RTX injected techniques, it's again designed around selling their product or their, their features of the 4000 cards rather than any performance improvements. And that's fine. That's, that's absolutely fine. That's what they're supposed to do. So take that as what it is. There's new functions and features that could allow teams and games and you know, indie developers to make improvements and mods to games using this. So that's great. But once we get back into a mixture of real titles, Rasterize and Ray Trace, such as Resident Evil Village, we're now back into that sub 50% improvements. And that again is that GeForce 2 MX, sorry, the RTX 4080 12 gigabyte, which is considerably slower than the older 3090 Ti to the tune of approximately 15%, it looks like it may even be more, which looks very similar to a, a 3060 Ti or maybe even a 3070 card. And in fact, the best game here is also itself an anomaly within the PC space, Microsoft Flight Simulator, as it's very CPU dependent. But again, we're seeing two times the performance uplift here. So again, most likely, this is not like for like. This is comparing DLSS 3.0 or 2.0 compared to the older version. So it's not like for like. We're not seeing raw rasterization power or raw ray tracing power without these functions and features. So like I said last time with the other card, the PC market and NVIDIA specifically, they've always claimed this, you know, teraflops are important. It's all about the power. That You can't keep doing it. We're at a situation now where they need to reinvent themselves and try something different. And now it's all about the technology. Like I say, it's fine, but then they're the ones that started the race. And AMD as well, they're guilty of it as well. You can't keep claiming power all the time because in the end, you're going to run out of it. And here we are, we've run out of it. So now it's smoke and mirrors. Now it's Paul Daniels time. Um, and, and that's a bit frustrating. So on, on face value and the more extreme areas, some of these tests are just made up in my opinion. And specific games are all hand-picked here, which is all to favor NVIDIA over AMD, which is, again, perfectly fine and normal. Everyone does that. But we can look at the graphs they've shown and normalize it and see that the 4090 is going to fall somewhere between 30, 60% faster than the 3090 Ti. Again, that's not guaranteed, and it probably is going to be at best. But that 4080 16 gig, 16 gig, 16 gig, it's going to be, what, 10, 20% slower than that? So for me, that's by far the best card. It's around 50% cheaper, £1,000, $1,000, but it's got around 89% of the performance. And that's obvious to NVIDIA as well, because they're going to launch it a month later. But that 4070 card, it's, it's not a 4080. It's got 12 gig, and as I've already covered, it's going to be heavily bottlenecked. Um, not even taking into account other things. It's got smaller bandwidth, significantly lower cores, and it's a different chip. It's an A106, not A104, so it's, not, it's definitely not a 4080. Um, and it's probably a salvage solution here from nvidia to try and claw some money back from the 3000 cards again this is a business practice so what they're probably doing is knowing that the market's just not going to buy these cards in any meaningful way they're not going to sell that huge 4090 is going to sell to professionals and that's it which is a very small part of their market so they know that they're going to leave it for a month before they release the proper you know targeted 4080 cards which will just when nvidia i'h sorry amd launched their new cards their uh, 7,000 cards. So they're going up ahead with them with a thousand pound card. So AMD have got the opportunity here to again sneak in and steal a lot of the market away because thousand pound for a card that's going to, you know, maybe compete, slightly beat a 4090 in some games, not all games. 
and then you're relying on again future features and everyone remembers the RTX 2000 launch where it took you know realistically two and a half years three years but we had some meaningful ray, ray tracing titles coming out it was all but bits and bobs and everyone kind of thought well what's the point in these cards we're here again now DLSS 3.0 has got a lot of legs it could be integrated easily into engines obviously with TAA and all the you know the information it needs is going to be based on the same things that DLS 2 uses so they should be backwards compatible you should have a situation where you know all your motion vectors and your, your object geometry and occlusion and all that should all work with the same way that DLSS does to regenerate an AI frame um, latency is going to go up obviously so what they're doing is they're saying, we know you're not going to buy these cards. We're going to charge them stupidly so that we get some profit out of them for the people that do buy them. But meanwhile, we're going to keep selling 3,000 cards because that's what you're going to buy. You're going to keep buying the ones that we want you to do. And this is another thing that's probably knocked on EVGA and you know the straw that broke the camel's back and they've ended their partnership with NVIDIA. And that's actually, they're, they're a big market. There's, that actually might sway some people away from NVIDIA because they bought NVIDIA because of the fact that EVGA was only an NVIDIA manufacturer. And if I was AMD, I would focus my time on trying to make EVGA a partner. If they're not already, I think they should. Uh, I think that could be a good win for AMD and it could be a big impact for Nvidia. Sometimes, you know, your worst enemy is your old friend. And we've seen this time and time again in this market. So I'll be interested to see where that goes. And it shows that Nvidia never learn, do they really? They never learn from their previous actions. And that's because the market lets them do it over and over again. These cards will offer better performance over the 3000 series. And I suspect we'll see nothing like the two four times uh, improvement they're showing here which is obviously shock horror it will be maybe 50 percent um again top for top i'd be interested to see what the 4080 16 gig compares against the 3080 that's probably the real uh, example they've not shown it here that tells you a lot um but again the problem is the marketing run that nvidia do they just they're just horrible they, they just lie to your face and they just make everything up and make it all really confusing for everybody, and that's on purpose. But again, many of the press seem to continue the sales pitch for them. And yeah, and Digital Foundry have done an exclusive access. Get it? Fine, you should do that. They, they're they well known to be within you know NVIDIA and work closely with them and get exclusive access. Get all that, right? But having a, a really early you know test on cards, hand-picked games, and then not being able to show any data again, which they did on the 3000 series as well, it, it's a problem for me. Um, and that is, by its very design, it's designed to trick the customer into buying something now without the full realistic view of what you're actually going to get. And the audience of that said website or channel, and it's not just Digital Foundry, it's others as well, they trust them and they feel like it's being impartial and it's not. I mean, if you're going to do a preview and, uh, uh, you know, it happens, I get that, but you've got to call out what you're doing. You've got to say this is an infomercial at this point and... There's no wait and see approach in it. There's no at the end like you would normally do. If I was doing a preview, I'd say, looks good. Uh, hopefully this will be great, but wait and see because you don't know what's going around the corner. That's what you would do for a genuine preview. But this is exclusive advertising for NVIDIA. So you've got to do what they tell you to do. Uh, they already had that whole issue a few years back when they were forcing people to sign these NDAs that were just incredibly restrictive and people just said no to it. So they couldn't get review cards. So NVIDIA have this, this practice that they do, and I don't like it. I've never liked it. It's a, it's, a, it's a monopoly practice, which is you do what we say. That's not how it should work in an open free market. You can absolutely say what you want, package things as you want, but you shouldn't be able to get away with the kind of stuff that they do. The, the uh, GTX 970 with its you know split pools of RAM and how they split off that and claimed it was a, a, a four gig card and you know, that 512 meg really impacted your performance when it happened because of the fact the bandwidth was down and it was just so slow so these kind of tactics they should be on the box i mean i guarantee you these boxes when they come out they won't have written on the back that this is a cut down die it's got all these you know less performance less bandwidth you're going to walk into a shop you're going to buy a 4080 or you let's say you bought your mum and dad go and get you a gpu right i'm not saying it's going to happen but let's say it did and you're not that well versed you just want a graphics card you want the latest one you want ray tracing you see two 4080s you see one that's 16 gig and one at 12 gig you're going to buy the 12 gig because it's cheaper was it 800 pound so you're going to say what 400 pound give or take for four gigabytes now i won't bother but that's not where you're saving the money you're buying a completely different card that's significantly paired back. And NVIDIA know this, and that's why they're doing it. And I'm not a fan, just not a fan of it at all. Um, call a card what a card is. So at the end of the day, what they're doing here is they're, they're well aware their market is shrinking. It's going to be a very bad year. Um, everyone's going into recession. We're all not less money to spend. And PC and all these extremes are going to be where they get hit. 
So they are marketing their items for the whales that are going to spend money on the top end, and then they're going to have discounts on their 3,000 cards to keep the revenue stream going, knowing that these cards are probably going to be a year away before they really catch on, maybe even longer. Um, so that's what I think NVIDIA are doing here. They're not going to stagger their launch. And this is why I think that AMD could come in and, and really, really become a competitor to NVIDIA. The problem is, I don't think AMD are going to do it. They're, they're going to come in and charge too much for their items. And we've just seen it with their 7,000 launch. You know, that's just come out and it, surprise, surprise, isn't selling very well, which it won't because CPU advancements are now quite limited. So they're going to have to cut the cost of that card, uh, those CPUs. They've already cut the price of the other ones, and I've just bought some because they've taken like 20% off, and that's what's going to happen. That's what NVIDIA do with their 3,000 cards, and that's probably why EVGA have jumped ship because they've telling them to, to cut the price down. So they're going to lose all their margins, and the AIBs always get hit hard. So AMD could come in and say, we'll give you... 4080 performance, but we'll, you can have it at £799. That would make a difference. If you can get the same performance, maybe even more, um, for £300 less or £200 less or $300 less or whatever, that's where they could be a disruptor. But I don't think they will. I think AMD will go, ah, oh, we've got a, a card that competes against it, we're going to charge the same. And it's just going to end up with no one moving, no one selling anything. And the, even though the 6000 was a great card, it still didn't hit NVIDIA hard enough. They could hear... Um, you can see the performance metric that they're going to go for. You know that NVIDIA are worried because look at the power usage here. Look at the clock speeds. They've had to get back to this, and most of this from a die shrink. You know, the architectural changes are around what they're selling, the DLS 3.0 and all this other stuff. So, again, probably gone on too long on this one, but uh, it, it's, it's something that I would say my advice to everyone, no matter how hardcore a PC game you are, do not buy a 4,000 card. Wait until reviews come out. Wait until games that you've seen, you play, you want to play, come out, and you can test them properly. At the moment, all we've seen is an infomercial, and everyone knows what they're like. Late o'clock, you know, two o'clock in the morning, when you're drunk out your face, thinking, oh, "I'll buy one of those cycle machines so that I can exercise while sitting down watching television." That would be a great idea. It never is. It just works. Everything just works. Global elimination just works. Ambient occlusion just works. Just work. Everything just works because ray tracing just works. It just works. So next up is Sony have released uh, obviously a new PS5, the CFI 1202. Um, and as expected, it's a reduced TSMC 6 nanometer node. So they've got a smaller APU in the box, which is obviously standard process because when you move to a new manufacturing node within the manufacturing plant, everyone's got to move to it because you can't keep changing the machines for those. So you get more out of the same wafer, as I said before. So it means that it, everything costs less. And then on top of that, because it's smaller, it uses less power, less heat. Less heat means less copper, and therefore you can reduce all of that. So it means you can save some money. So that's probably mitigating the price rise. Because let's be honest, the £30 they've added on isn't enough to balance out the rising of the dollar and the dropping of other currencies. Although that'll balance out, markets always move, don't panic too much on things. But it'll be interesting to see what they do with the inevitable PS5 Slim next year, because that's kind of timelines that they work to. So this is kind of the stepping stone into that. Um, and that might mean that we get a much smaller box, we get it thinner, we get it cheaper to, for them to make, and they might be able to bring the price back down to where it was. This might be a temporary measure, and they phase these models out. So it'll be interesting to see where that goes, and obviously that's the main important part, is that obviously if everyone buying a PS5, there'll be more on the market, because you get more out of the node, therefore they can make more, that's one of the main reasons. But also, inevitably, when they get to the PS5 Slim, that becomes a much bigger adoption rate for a lot of people, and if it's a cheaper price, so back down to what it was, that will make a huge difference. Obviously, the other thing is the fact they're going to go down this route of having a split drive. So you can now plug in a drive to the base model. And that's probably the slim that we're talking about here. Hence why they'll make it slim, because it'll be much smaller without the drive unit on it. You can then buy a separate drive, plug it in via the USB, and use that with your slim. So you won't, you'll basically you'll get a digital model only. That's what they're going to go to. They'll sell a digital model um, and probably have a bundle where you can have digital with a separate drive or you buy the drive separately, which I think is a good thing because what it also means is if your drive dies, which is a common problem for all consoles and all you know, digital media in terms of optical drives, then it means you haven't got to go and get your console fixed. As long as the, 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 the older versions work, you can just take your old PS5, plug in this drive, and it will use the drive itself, which I think is a great idea. Um, so, yeah, I do suspect this is just standard practice. There's nothing exciting here. It's just in the current day we live, everyone's just rushing to get as much information into an article as possible, and they talk about these things like they're new. They're not new. They're all standard. It's all expected. 
um, just like last generation with the you know the pros that came out with the Xbox One X and the PS4 Pro. These node shrinks can be used two ways. They can cut cost and power, as we're seeing here, or you can just use that cost reduction to bump up power, as we saw with those. Whether that will happen here, I doubt it. I doubt that they want to segment the market yet again. I don't think the Pro was anything more than just to make sure that that 4K model worked on that console. They could still support it because that wasn't possible with the PS4. And um, that's not an option here. It's not an issue. You know, their, their PS5 supports 8K if it wants it, which is pointless. It supports 120 FPS. It supports VRR. So there's no reason for them to do that other than to try and compete against ray tracing. And that's just for the hardcore, not the main mass market. You know, people who play COD, for example, are not going to care about ray tracing. They're just going to turn it off. So I'll be interested to see what this means in the future um, for their cost model. But right now, no cost reduction. But I do quite like the fact that they've got the separate disc. I think that's a good option. And as long as they continue to support it forever, it means that they can have the best of both, which is um, you get to have digital if you want to. <sighs> or people like me and others that want to keep physical media alive they get to keep it and that actually is a good point for you know we've got to say good things and bad things about every company and the good thing here is microsoft have listened to feedback i, I talked about it in a previous video i talked about it on other videos i'm a big stalwart against everything to do with you know online subscription models and drm check-ins and all that especially with discs you own xbox have actually backed out of their drm solution so they're now closer to what sony do uh, you can buy a digital game and play it absolutely fine you've still got to check in on that because i get that i hope that they can get close to sony's model by giving you a, a window of being able to play offline for a certain amount of time and then a check-in is required but right now what you've got is you can now you can now take a disc and rather than before where well, you had to complete it online i cover that in cyberpunk install you can put it in, in the drive it'll install it won't force you to update it so you can still play the old version on the series x now and not forced to update to the later version and it means you can now play the title offline completely. You don't need a DRM check. And that is great news. And that is Microsoft reacting to the market. They know they need good PR. They know they're not in a good place with all the things they're doing with Game Pass and taking over the market. And it's creating this whole turmoil of, you know, them against us and everything else. So this is good. This is why, you know, good things can come from bad situations. So here we are with Microsoft actually going backwards and saying, we're not going to force you down a digital path at this point. If you own the disc, you can play the disc. Like I said before, it's not going to change your BC stuff because you still need to download the BC titles. So if you're playing, you know, Xbox One or Xbox 360 titles, it doesn't change. You still got to put the disc in, sync it, download the, the latest XD, which is basically a, a converted version of that to run on the hardware and then intercept the cores within that, you know, emulator pack that it comes with. So all of that is still the same, but you can still take your Xbox titles now and just play them offline, which is great. Really, really good. And well done, Microsoft, for listening and reacting. It's great. So this is why we should always keep making this noise and things like, does it play on um, Twitter? Great account that does a lot of good work, tests all this stuff and you know, give them a big thumbs up. I always support them. This is great. This is what we need to drive that, you know, the issues that affect us as gamers, because what's the point in buying physical media when that's, you can't use it? It just doesn't make any sense on, on new hardware. That's just pointless. So I, I get BC. Uh, you, you can't change that. Um, there's probably ways around it, but we'll see. But it would be very frustrating if this was a continued process. So let's hope that the competition stays. And this is why you need competition. This is why you need no one. If Sony was dominant in the market and the only player in this market, you would definitely see situations that we had before. So it's important that we keep this the way it is, which is let's keep competition going. So next up is is content. Um, you would have seen I've got the Uncharted and Lost Legacy update VR on my channel earlier this week, which hopefully was enjoyable. If you haven't checked it out, check it out. It's a good update. It, again, it's going to become a standard. As I say, this is the whole Sony process of updating titles across the board with similar packs. So I think we'll see more older titles getting this update, um, potentially offering this as a as a boost to the current version that's running on the box. Whether we'll see it with new titles being re-released, it's probably going to be the caveat that is remasters come with this as a standard um, it probably won't be possible as part of the BC pack uh, because it's just too complicated to get into that level of access to the box I've covered that before in my old video so it's good that we're seeing these kind of updates coming and hopefully we'll see more and more of them uh, under the content um, my retro update the, the Mortal Kombat one I've been working on for a while it got bigger as it always does so it's something that's going to come out for Halloween. It's best about right. So you expect it in the next two weeks, uh, just in time for the 30th anniversary of Mortal Kombat, a big game for many of us. Um, 
being one that came out after I left school. So it was a title that was something that was big for me at the time. Probably the last hurrah in arcades, as far as I'm concerned, when it was still a social sport. I used to go to the arcades and play it. A uh, big part of it. But also, I've kind of taken a little turn with this one. It's 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 a bigger retro. It's, it's more encompassing. It's more like a documentary um, covering the rise of... Of the inspirations and muses that come from titles and films and music and games and how all of these things merged. So hopefully it's enjoyable. It's it's probably a little long compared to some of the stuff that I've done, um, but hopefully it's something that kind of expands the what I do and what people watch my channel for. And I'll be interested to see what patrons think who will get access to it early and first, uh, and they'll actually get a longer version as well um, because. I'm aware it might be too much in certain directions on things I'm covering. It's all relevant. It's all very, very relevant and it means to an end. So, again, if you are a patron, be sure to give me feedback on that. I do enjoy and need that kind of feedback because, you know, I make these things in a bubble and I generally stick to the same rule I've always stuck to, which is I make stuff that I myself would want to watch. That's what I make. And then you're true to it. So that's one thing that I'm doing. So hopefully you can get a view on that. And if you're not a patron... You can always become one uh, and help me with any you know, pounds or dollars you can give, which really helps the channel grow and obviously helps me subsidise the stuff that I do because I'm independent here. Everything I do is on the on the side of my full-time job, family, kids, everything else. So it's great, and I do like working with the IGN team and getting a bigger coverage there and covering titles that I probably wouldn't get access to myself directly, so that's always good. There was a question on Patreon that I will quickly cover as well, which is about light guns. So the question is, do you think light guns will make a comeback and are they possible uh, with modern TVs? Well, I've covered this in detail before with my CRT screens um, videos, so go and check those out. But y y fundamentally, yes, um, they could, and they could be better than what they were on CRT. So the simple description is, for CRTs, they were kind of designed around, like, the way light guns work were designed around CRTs, and you, you can't do that, as a question quite rightly asks. You can't do that on modern screens because they're basically a raster line that runs across the screen and then they can flash that so things like um well the old games like periscope you you flash the target area that can be shot with a white dot and then the gun itself is just a, an infrared beam a, a little sensor an optical sensor and it picks up that bright light on the screen itself because it's a phosphor that flashes up and that targets a hit um, there's variations thereof, but that's fundamentally what it is. It tracks that raster line, and when it's bright, it picks up that it's hit that area, and that those targets get picked up as part of it. Uh, it won't work like that on modern screens, but you can do it very simply. And Nintendo did it with the Wii Remote. So essentially, that's the infrared bar at the bottom, which emits an infrared light, and then the actual Wii Remote itself has got a little optical sensor in it that can pick up the light, and therefore with the accelerators the gy gyroscopes inside the Wii remote it can also track your movement and also where you're aiming and that's how the light gun works infrared lights effectively and then the Wii itself calculates the distance between you know point x and point y so it could figure out where you are in 3d space and therefore it, that's how it works it's a great solution you put it under the tv it works and even the you know the lg uh, Wii magic remote works the same way it's got gyroscopes in it, its bluetooth connection it doesn't need a sensor um, but effectively it figures out where you are but that can also get interference you can go out of sync and all that kind of stuff with them so those options would work they would work fine um, but to me the way it's all going to go is, is VR VR is where it's going to work you've got PSVR 2 coming out soon you've got um, Quest you've got loads of options within that space and that's for me is better than just pointing at a 2D screen and and shooting a gun i'm sure you know, that's that's not the point of your question i'm trying to kind of round up what i'm saying so i think that what we've got now in vr is much better uh it's more interactive it's a th whole 3d world and i think there's going to be significant leaps in the next generation of vr with psvr 2 and hopefully that'll push things on where we get more than just that interaction you know having that haptic feedback on the headset itself and the controllers brings all of that in and that means you can just shoot in 3d space at objects you can see stand around run around and all of that is is one of the reasons why i like vr because it just makes everything feel so different to what we've currently played before because you're immersed in this world for short bouts and takes you back to arcades i say the same thing over and over again so that's that um and then new content have i covered new content i think i have so yeah, hopefully that wasn't too boring and too long. Um, I am going to try and get this one up on one of the Apple podcasts as well so people can listen to it on the bus or whatever, on the train when they're travelling around in your headset. Uh, and obviously it makes it easy for me to put these together when I'm just talking and there's no video involved. But obviously here you are with the video as well. Uh, just to try and give you something in the background. Anyway, that's it. I hope you guys and girls enjoyed it. Otherwise, I'll see you very soon on the next one. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Thank you.